Welcome to Goldfish on Games and a series that I'm tentatively calling Cover Disc Deep Dive. Don't worry, Cover Disc Face Off will be back next month. I just needed a break. So what are we going to be doing in this series? Well we'll be taking a deeper look at a single disc, and in this instance it's a compact disc for February of 1998 and it's from PC Format. Now even though we're going to be taking a deeper look at it, we're still not going to be able to cover everything, as this was quite the packed disc. So let's just jump in and see what's on it. The disc itself supports autoplay, that would get you to accept their terms, and then it would also check to see if you had all the core software already installed to play the games. And what I'd managed to forget over the last 25 years was that it came with a menu, where everything was neatly siloed into sections like Games, Technique, Shareware, Hospital, Critical List and The Wired World. And we will check out all of them as we go, but where else can we start but with Games? And let's go with the one that's in the taskbar because I forgot to clear it earlier. Sega Touring Car Championship. This was that weird time where Sega were starting to put out PC ports of some of their bigger titles. And getting into the game we find... Well it's a very fast running if very low resolution game and one that feels like the frame rate might affect the gameplay as well. Now you might have noticed there were no options when we started, and that's because Sega wrote these as proper PC programs, with a drop down menu. Which is fine if you're running it in a window, but if it's full screen you're going to have to hit the ALT key to get it to show up, and if you didn't even realise that, well you might not even know that there are these options. But from here we can change the resolution, and also increase the graphics quality. So when we finally make it back into the game, it looks so much better, if a little bit slower than before. Now this machine is a Pentium 1 200MHz, that has 32MB of RAM, a Creative Sound Blaster or 32 sound card, and a Voodoo 1. And let's not forget Windows 95, which at this point still would have been the latest OS from Microsoft, as it is still early 1998. So I think this gives a very good indication of what the average gamer would have experienced at the time, and it's not far off how I would have experienced it when I was playing these demos back in the day. Which for the most part is a fine if short demo for a decent Sega racing game, as you only get two laps and one car. But you can select between manual and automatic, so there is that. But on an interesting note, this is a software only game, it didn't touch the voodoo card at all. So being able to try out those various graphics options was very important for gamers at the time. The next game is Jack Nicholson's Golf, and it goes to show how varied the games on these covered CDs could be. It also shows how many studios were trying to make sports games at the time, and how big a platform the PC was for them, as this is the fifth one of this series by Accolade. And this seems to be quite the sizeable demo, as there's a lot of holes for you to play. And the way that I play golf, this could take me quite some time to get through all of them. It's neat that it seems to be quite the complete demo, as it even has the voices, which mostly is the man himself telling me that I messed up a shot. I hit a tree, let's see if it stays there. 
It looks quite nice and there's a decent number of options for the graphics and the overlay, so you can scale it down or up depending on your hardware. And then just play a few rounds of golf. This par 4 should be fun. Pull left. I hit a tree. Let's see if it stays there. That's a miserable lie. Jumping back to the menu, we have a few technical programs to check out. Now I'm going to skip over the CAD software as I have no idea how to use it, but instead let's check out the power user tools, which turns out to be shareware. But this has a number of tools included, like being able to have multiple desktops and being able to quickly switch between them all from this pop-up window at the top of the screen or this customizable menu that you can get to start software, insert key presses into current running ones, or a bunch of other things. And there's even ones for extending the clipboard, so it'll even save out anything you put into it to the drive, which I could see being useful in some limited situations. But this is software I like to call nagware, because it will constantly nag you about registering it and paying for the full version. The other bit of software I want to show off is Zara Webster, which is a vector based art package aimed at making artwork for websites. It seems to have all of the normal vector art tools like drawing shapes, applying gradients and colours, but I think this is more meant to do stuff like animation and creating GIFs than just being a regular art package. Which means that that is obviously the things that they wanted to restrict in this time demo. You can't export as any other decent format, it's only the built in one. So it is very limited. Now what I found interesting is that it came with a silent video that goes over some of the things you can do with it. I guess that's one way to try and fill up the space on these cover CDs. And let's jump back to the games again, as there are quite a few of them for us to go through. And the next one is a personal favourite of mine, it's Battlezone, or as we like to call it now, Battlezone 98. And yes, this is the very demo that got me interested in this game and this series, and it made me buy the full thing when it launched. And it is a very detailed demo as well as it includes all the tutorial missions as well as a few actual in-game missions as well. And it really blows that racing game out of the water for when it comes to content. I went looking for a few cowboys to do the job and in the end they orchestrated the world's biggest cover up. Unfortunately the what it doesn't do is run as well as I remember. Which is more likely a trick of the memory as this machine is actually a little bit more powerful than what I played it on at the time. Well, outside the voodoo card as it's the exact same one that I had back then. This demo left me in a bit of a quandary as at the time the Pentium 2s were around and the voodoo 2 cards had just launched. So I could have shown this off running much better. But I played and completed the demo and then the full game on similar hardware in the 90s. So if I had to suffer it, so do you, or something or other, you know. But let me know in the comments if you think that future videos should use the more powerful hardware, or what was more common at the time, or at least more common to me and my mates. But either way, this is still a great game. You get to build bases and units. You can jump in and out of craft and fly almost anyone that you can find, as well as commanding whole armies against a Cold War era Russia, and on the moon. It has an interesting story given in voiceovers while the level loads, but also in the missions as well, which are nice and varied so it's an amazing game. Keeping the theme of strategy and combat going, we are looking at Lords of Magic next. Please select your leader type. As you get to choose your character type, Warrior, May, Thief, May. 
but not their alignment. You have to worship life. And what does all this mean? I haven't a clue, as this is a very complex looking game, with lots of RPG style elements, and it plays out in this isometric view. And you get to move around your group of heroes, and then interact with villages, towns and other places on the map. But it's all done in turns, with each of the alignments getting their own turn. And during your turn you can capture places on the map, or just visit towns to trade. But the big thing seems to be the combat, as there will be locations that you'll have to fight if you want to get them. And this sticks with an isometric view, but it's much more zoomed in with the combat being real-time as well, although you can pause it at any time. And you also have a small group of people that will be helping you out, so it's not just you versus the world. And winning, well, it'll obviously give you the typical rewards, but you might also get some turn-based extras, like extra gold for as long as you can control the mine. This looks to be really quite deep and a lot to learn, so it is quite helpful that there are pop-up messages that tell you what you can do. I'm not sure if there's any overriding story, but it might have to be one I'll look into in more detail, as I only just realised that I have a box copy. I picked it up cheap one day, and I honestly can't remember when, so this might have to be something I will check out properly. to the menu I think it's time to look at some shareware, but due to the amount that's here we can only take a look at a few of them. I know this is meant to be a deep dive, but this video would be hours long if we checked out absolutely everything in detail. Which is what made these cover CDs so great back in the day, as you had no idea what you'd find. It could have been screensavers like what we've been looking at here, or even shareware DOS games which this one turned out to be quite a lot of fun. It plays a bit like Thrust, as you have to fly around shooting things, but also collect the bomb to take out the base. It's limited to just a 30 day trial, and after that you have to pay, but it is a lot of fun, and it's called Terrifier if you want to check it out. I ended up playing a bunch of this, as it looked quite nice and it played really well. It's just a perfect bit of shareware. The software side of things is also quite good, as there is quite the selection. As do you need something to help recover corrupted files, or back up your work, then you can find it here. It has a bit of something for everyone. They also included patches for games. Now this disc is a little light on those, but here we just have a big self extracting zip file that's just full of patches, maps and tools for Quake 2. Which is useful as these would have taken ages to download over dial up. And that's even if you had to dial up at the time. Which wasn't a given. Like imagine having to download the almost 40 megabyte Wing Commander Prophecy demo. That would have taken 3 hours at least on my 28.8 kilobit modem. But damn what a demo you would have gotten if you downloaded it. Thankfully I got it on the CD instead as this is a 4 mission pack that features unique content just for the demo. Oh yes. And while many of the features are disabled, we do get the main areas of the game, even if they are quite limited. And to play this right I had to bring out the old game port joystick, because it deserves to be played correctly, even if this stick is a little bit limited in its movement and buttons.
but it really helps to show off what a special game this was, as you get the mission briefings, and then you get launched off the ship to take on the weird alien race, with a game that just looks lovely. You even get all the comm chatter that's going on as well, and little video clips in the corner. That's a kill. I played the heck out of this demo back in the day, and then obviously the full game a little later on, as this was a real showcase for the 3DFX card. Due to it playing so well on a Voodoo 1, it even had features that the Direct3D and software renderers didn't have, so it looked even better. If you played Prophecy before and enjoyed it, but not played this, then you really should do, because it does have an exclusive set of missions, so it is quite a lot of fun. And we move from one type of flight combat to another, with F-22 Raptor. Which if you watched any of my cover disc videos, you will know that I'm terrible at flight sims. But there were two different ones on this disc, so we had to check at least one of them out, and this won the coin toss. The game was made by Novologic, who made a number of these similar flight sim style games and then went on to make the Delta Force games, which mostly used the same voxel style rendering tech, that allowed them to draw these huge detailed looking terrains, but it also came with a bit of a downside, such as using a lot of CPU power, so that's why it's struggling a little bit here. Also due to the tech, it didn't fully support 3D cards either, so it's completely being run on the CPU but it does look very nice, and the external views even better. But as is the way with these games, I really have little idea of what I'm doing, or where I'm going. There seems to be some targets, but I'm having a hell of a time trying to track them down. But it is great to see that this style of detailed flight combat game was still popular in the late 90s, as there were a few companies producing them, and they continued to push graphics and the quality of their simulation as they went as well. The CD also came with a bunch of standard tools that were always useful to have like the never-ending trial of WinZip, or installers for graphics libraries like DirectX. And something that I found that I thought was quite interesting was a video that was advertising a new magazine. 80% of all the scientists who've ever lived are alive today. The magazine is dedicated to making sense of tomorrow by reporting and explaining the very latest science and technology news. Have a look and tell me what you think. But the final section is possibly the one that's most out of date, as it's mostly installers for long dead dial-up services. RIP Demon Online. But there were a few tools that might still be quite useful, but instead of looking at those, we have a fight on our hands, as it's between Warhammer and Warhammer. We start with Warhammer, or 40k Final Liberation to give it its full name, which was released by SSI. And out of all the menu options, we only have the tutorial scenario available. Not that I'm sure why they called it a tutorial, as it doesn't seem to have anything in it. It just drops you in with very little in the way of guidance or information. This is a turn-based strategy game, in which you are the Space Marines against the Orcish Horde. Or at least that's what I think it's about. For a tutorial campaign, it doesn't hold your hand at all as the Orcs have already garrisoned a number of buildings, which means they can get to attack you really quite easily, and you can't even see them until they've done so. And by that point, they might have taken out an entire squad already. So I found moving the tanks in to provide cover to be the best bet, 
but even then, they seem to keep making shots that you can't do yourself. And in the best tradition of the genre, you get a number of action points, and these can be used to move or attack, or if you do very small amounts, you can do both of them at the same time. So you might not want to take big movements at the beginning of the game, because they're going to surprise attack you instead. So instead, try and move slowly, so they can attack you, and then you can try and counter-attack afterwards. That seems to be a better approach. The game looks nice enough, if a little basic for the time. It's very much what I would expect if someone said an isometric turn-based strategy game. But this was an odd time in PC gaming, where we're at this crossroads between fully 3D games, fake 3D, and regular 2D. So it has been interesting to see all the various games on the CD, and how they fit into the various categories. But when it comes to playing this game, I might not be the best person to take any advice from, and so far I've had one game where I've won, and one game where I've lost. And I have absolutely no idea how either of those outcomes happened. I'm sure I'll work it out with time, as I do normally enjoy these types of games, but something doesn't quite sit right with me with this one. Come as well. So let's see if the second one is any better, as it's Warhammer Dark Omen. Which is a fully 3D real-time strategy game published by EA. In this mission we're trying to protect this church, and we have to place our limited units around it. And then it seems the enemy will attack us in waves. Which is where the careful unit placement comes into play, as you'll have to give them orders. But the interface, it's a little bit clunky for this as some of the units will move around if you click, others will just start shooting at that spot instead. And moving around the map is really fiddly. The arrow keys handle zoom and rotation, rather than just moving around, and you have to keep right clicking on the mouse to move the camera. You also need to be aware of friendly fire, as while those wizards can deal huge amounts of damage, it can hit your troops just as easily as the zombie-like forces, and if they take too much damage, it's quite possible that they will run away from the fight. We're under attack. I think it's quite obvious that I've not played either of these games before, and I'm not quite sure what to do with them just yet. It's ones that I would have to put a lot of time into to really learn. So I'm not really sure which of these two that I would play more. They both seem to be quite interesting for different reasons, but it is cool that there was a time where there was multiple Warhammer games coming out, and from different companies that were even trying to do their own thing. And even the graphical styles were different, but I guess it helps that one is Warhammer, while the other one is Warhammer 40k. But I do think it's funny that the futuristic one is the one also running on a more dated looking engine. To arms. Charge. And as I think this video is getting a little bit long, I feel it might be worth ending it here. But I say that knowing that we didn't get a chance to show off every single demo, or every bit of software, as we missed out games like Fallout, or even Dilbert. Hmm, well, it might be good that we didn't cover everything. There was even a second CD that had a complete multimedia package called Dazzler, that sadly I feel we didn't really have the time to look into, or even learn how to use it properly. And there we have it, I think we've gone into quite a lot of detail on this CD. The other one, well, I think we're fine not looking into it, because it was just a single program that I mentioned. And if you thought that I went too deep, or not deep enough, then let me know in the comments. Likewise, if you have a better name for this series, because as I said, Covered Disc Deep Dive is just a tentative name at the moment. So until next time, I was the Goldfish, 
That was quite the month for PC gaming, and this was Goldfish on Games. Thank you for watching. I do hope you enjoyed looking at this 90s era cover CD. I had a lot of fun and forgot how good some of the titles on this disc were, and I'd really like to look at more of these. So if I've done those, you'll find links up at the screen right now, or you can hit some of those buttons below to let me know what you really thought of the video.